to turn to um, John 4.4. 4. I'm going to read a, a chunky piece of passage and then just um, bring out some really amazing things that the Lord had, has shown me. So this is the um, story of the Samaritan woman. And I'm in the wrong version. Just a moment. Okay. But he had to pass through Samaria, starting from verse 4, 4-4. Four, four. But he had to pass through Samaria. Now he came to a Samaritan woman, uh, a Samaritan town called Sakar, near the plot of land that Jacob had given his son Joseph. <coughs> Jacob's, Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, since he was tired from the journey, sat right down beside the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. For his disciples had gone off into the town to buy supplies. So the Samaritan woman said to him, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for water to drink? For Jews use nothing, uh, for Jews, uh, for Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you had known the gift of God and who it was that said to you, give me some water to drink, you, had have, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said to him, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where, do you, where then do you get this living water? Surely you're not greater than our ancestor Jacob, are you? For he gave us this well and drank from it himself, along with his sons and his livestock. Jesus replied, everyone who drinks some of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks some of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come back here. The woman replied, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right. You, you are right with, when you said you have no husband. For you had five husbands, and the man you are living with now is not your husband. This you said truthfully. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you people say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and now is here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshippers. God is spirit. And the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one called Christ. Whenever he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I am the one speaking to you. Oh, sorry, I, the one speaking to you, am he. And I think I'm going to stop there for now. No, I'm not. I'm going to keep going to 34. Sorry. Now, at that, at that very moment, his disciples came back. They were shocked because he was speaking with a woman. However, no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went off into the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Surely he can't be the Messiah, can he? So they left the town and began coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the disciples began to say to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did they? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. Amen. We could just stop there because that's amazing. So... I had, um, I just wanted to find out who these Samaritans were, and I just got this. I'm just going to read it from Blue Letter Bible. This is where I got this from. 
The Samaritans were a group of people who lived in Samaria, an area north of Jerusalem. They were half Jews and half Gentiles. When Assyria captured the northern king kingdom of Israel in 721 BC, some were taken into captivity while others left behind. The ones left behind intermarried with the Assyrians. Thus, these people were neither fully Hebrew nor fully Gentiles. The Samaritans had their own unique copy of the five first books of Scripture, as well as their own unique system of worship. And although they had the Torah and a system of worship, now uh, when the day... Oh, sorry, sorry. This is what Luke 9, 51 to 53 says. So they, they were neither either. They had a form of godliness... They had the Torah, but they were also unclean, right? The Jews, they didn't associate with the Samaritans. And the, the Samaritans didn't even associate with them. This is what Luke 9, 51 to 53 says. And although they had the Torah and a system of worship is recorded, now when the days drew near for him, Jesus, to be taken up, Jesus set out um, resolutely to go to Jerusalem. He sent messages messengers on ahead of him and as they went along they entered a Samaritan village to make things ready in advance for him but the villagers refused to welcome him because he had determined to go to Jerusalem so they these were not people in relationship with one another and so I want to focus on I want to find out why Jesus had to go there why did Jesus have to go the way of Samaria this is quite interesting. In the NET um, version, you see those little clouds above words, certain words? This is quite cool. I want to go to the word. Ah, there we go. He had. Okay. So listen to this. Travel through Samaria was not geographically necessary. The normal route for Jews ran up the east side of the Jordan. Although some take the impersonal verb had to here to indicate logical necessity only, normally in John's gospel, its use involves God's will or plan. So let's see that. In John 4.4, 4, we just read, but he had to go through Samaria. In John 3, 7, it says, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must all be born from above. John 3, 14, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3, 30, He must become more important while I become less important. God's, uh, John 4, 24, God is spirit and the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John 9, 4 and 5, we must perform the deeds of the one who sent me as long as it is daytime. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And John 10, 16, I have other sheep that do not come from this sheepfold. I must bring them to and they will listen to my voice so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. And the last one, John 20 verse 9, for they did not yet understand the scripture that said uh, that Jesus must rise from the dead. So these musts and the fact that Jesus had to go through Samaria had nothing to do with Jesus just having a plan to go through Samaria. This was the Father's will that he go through Samaria, that he have a divine encounter with this woman. Uh, this was his plan. So Jesus demonstrated by his life what it looks like to live the cross life. There is no option. It is, I must and I had to. There's no option. I must speak the truth. I must not water it down. I had to. I was compelled to confront that lie with truth. Why? It's not my will. It's his will being done. And Jesus demonstrated this even by having to go through Samaria. This was him demonstrating it's not my will. I can go another route but I have to go through Samaria. So John 4, 28 to 30 and 39 to 42, it was the Father's will that in this encounter with Jesus, 
this half-caste Jew Gentile <laughs> would have revealed to her the mystery of Messiah. That was the Father's will. This half-caste have a form of godliness, even have a unique system of worship, must, you must go through Samaria so this half-caste can encounter the revelation of Messiah, the one in whom she read of but had not yet come to inwardly know. She learned that to know Jesus was beyond knowing the Torah in black and white, but had not come to inward, uh, but had not yet come to inwardly know. She learned that to know Jesus was beyond. Oh, sorry, I've just read the other line again. Sorry, let me start again. She learned that to know Jesus was beyond knowing the Torah, but to truly know Him would mean she would never thirst again. Her Torah didn't do that. Her Bible knowledge didn't quench the thirst didn't quench the hunger. Just knowing black words on a white paper doesn't do that. You have to know him intimately. And her unique system of worship, this is awesome. Jesus showed her this profound mystery of Christ in a people and them becoming one in the spirit that would be people who worship in spirit and, and truth. She had this geographical view. We worship up there. You worship in Jerusalem. But he says, no, 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 time is coming. Well, you're not going to go up there and you're not going to go there. I'm going to come in. And by that source alone, you will worship in spirit and in truth. So this living water is going to come. This is a Samaritan woman in a half caste. Half Jew, half Gentile, on the fence, not really, ha not knowing, not even recognizing. But she said, she did say, the Messiah is coming. So she knew of the one to come, but didn't see him, didn't recognize that he was before her. But it was the Father's will that he had to go through Samaria for this one woman. This revelation of Jesus. Ah, this is amazing. And from that, what does she do? She goes to the town. She tells every, everyone. They come out because of her testimony. That was all it was at that point in time. Because of the testimony of Jesus in her, what, what she had encountered, they all came out. Is that not what, what happened to us? There's a testimony of Jesus that just bubbles should just bubble. You can't encounter Jesus and something not want to come out of you. She could not contain herself. She had to go and tell this man knew everything. He knew about all my husbands. He knew about my de facto. She wasn't even embarrassed. He knew it all. But he, he told me that he could be living water in me. What? This is profound. This is profound. Um, oh gosh, that's why I should stick to my notes. <laughs> um, yes, so that worship was not actually an outward geographical location on a mountain or in Jerusalem, but was in fact an inward life that was governed by spirit and truth. And it didn't matter the location. She met the mystery of salvation herself face to face and was never the same again. Uh, oh my goodness. And I didn't do spell checks, so I can't even read my own writing. But do you know the profound thing about this? It said that the disciples had gone. They had no part in this. Jesus didn't need the disciples to do this. He was showing something profound. I want us to go down to, I didn't read this in the first thing. But Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. Don't you say there are four more months and then comes the harvest. I tell you, look up and see that the fields are already white for harvest. 
The one who reaps receives pay and gathers fruit for eternal life so that the one who sows and the one who reaps can rejoice together. For in this instance, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you did not work for. So in that situation, Jesus himself sowed the seed. And then the disciples were reaping the harvest. So Jesus sowed the word of truth, the revelation of salvation and true worship. She then went on to tell everybody else who then came and they said, we came because of her report, but now we believe. Now we believe. What does it say? Um, okay, let me just read that. This is what they said. Now the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the report of the women who, woman who testified. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they began asking him to stay with them. He stayed with them there two days. And because of his word, many more believed. They said to the woman, no longer do we believe because of your words. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this one really is the saviour of the world. All because of a testimony. And the disciples had nothing to do with it. But here it says after that, Jesus, after that two days, Jesus departed. His disciples didn't go. So they got, they reaped disciples that they never sowed for. They didn't labour for those. They were off shopping. And Jesus was preparing a harvest to entrust them with when he left to go to Galilee. That is profound. I mean, and that is the, that's in that situation there, but this is the gospel. We, the, the prophets, the apostles, Christ Jesus himself, the foundation is laid. We didn't labor for that. Our job is to preach Christ. Our job is to point to Jesus, those disciples, and he will do it. He will bring people, and that's still our job. Discipleship is forever pointing to Jesus. That's all she did. She said, come and see him. Come and see the one who told me everything. That didn't happen. It doesn't say, I know there's many miracles that are not, a, not written in the word of God, but this account is just once. It wasn't an everyday occurrence. It was a one moment, an intervention of divine power where because it was the Father's will, Jesus went by way of Samaria and this encounter happened. And his disciples had nothing to do with it. And they kind of missed the boat a little bit. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if the Lord sent People in, I shared that vision last week that many would come in so that the walls would collapse. If that happens, what happens if they have such a divine encounter with the Lord Jesus that they reveal something to you that you don't know? And yet they're, you're entrusted to disciple them. Huh? That is cool. Isn't that humility? You can't get on your high horse then. Humble yourself. The disciples missed it. This is amazing. But then Jesus left them to disciple this, this harvest that they didn't need. They neither labored for nor sowed into until Jesus left. This is so profound. They didn't get that his heart. This is, um, if you go to 31 to 34 again, there's a little note here on the word work. It says, note again the misunderstanding the disciples. The disciples thought that Jesus referred to physical food. <laughs> so what do we say? But meanwhile, the disciples were urging the rabbi to eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the disciples began to say to one another, has anyone brought him food? So they didn't get it. The disciples saw that Jesus referred to physical food. He was speaking figuratively and spiritually again. Thus, Jesus was forced to explain what he had meant. But he could talk to this woman at the well about deep spiritual truths and she was like, wow, I get this. And the disciples were like, huh, did someone go and buy him food before we got back? 
Something profound is going on here, remaining childlike in faith. There's something so cool here. Thus Jesus was forced to explain what he meant and the explanation that his food was his mission to do the will of God and accomplish his work leads naturally into the metaphor of harvest. The fruit of the mission was represented by the Samaritans who were coming to him. This was him. They were coming to him, this unclean, on the fence, bit of this, bit of that. I'm going to worship my own unique way. I'm going to, I'm going to have my version of the Torah coming to a living water. And the disciples missed the food. <laughs> they missed it. But this woman who was void, she knew nothing and yet had an incredible encounter with Jesus that left her completely transformed and the town around her. Isn't that amazing? There is this story. I I've never seen this story like this before. I've, this is profound, this woman's encounter and all by the will of God. Isn't it the work of God to believe? but also that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obeying, I had to go that way. And we've all had those like moments where something is just, the Lord is, go this way or go and talk to that one. Go and see how they're going and something divine happens. You didn't initiate that. You didn't even think about that. But because you listened to that small, still voice and you went out of your way, out of the easy way. There were other routes. But he had to go the way of Samaria because God's will was that someone was there that he wanted to encounter and bring deep revelation to. So I want to encourage us that if we want to see the word come to pass, that God is going to bring increase, I want us to know that it's got nothing to do with us. <laughs> nothing to do with us. This testimony I shared with you had nothing to do with me apart from prayer and belief. That's it. I could not change him. He could not change me. It was God alone. I cannot change Australia or the nations. My kids, I can't do it. You can't do it. But if God's given a promise, we can believe it. If he's given a promise, we can believe it. And discipleship. Discipleship is not standing up here once a week, speaking the word of God to you. Discipleship, I'm sorry, is going to have to be you walking alongside one another. Intimately knowing each other's issues and discipling one another in Jesus. I remember there were times of, I would have coffee catch up with Cheryl and I would be um, crying and she, <laughs> she'd say, but you have a promise. <laughs> Sometimes I wanted to nicely put that beautiful cake, like just smoosh it around her. I was like, no, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> don't just tell me that. I want you to stroke my back today, Cheryl. Give me your shoulder to cry on today, Cheryl. Nope. She didn't cater to my, <laughs> my little needs. She'd just direct me back to, you've got a promise. That's it. That's discipleship. He is your promise. He is the one. And it doesn't, discipleship isn't a, a one week thing. It's not a one-year thing either. And there are, Eva and I talk about this often, this is such a, I said to her, if she has been the one that the Lord has just given me to everything I receive of him, I just pour. I'm like, here, go, have this, have this, have this, have this, have this. I just pour into her all the time. I love it. And I was saying to Adam, if it was only Eva that he ever entrusted me with, it has been a joy. Why? Not because of me, but because um, our little catch-ups of, 
hey, this is what the word says. Remember this. That's getting less and less, and it's rejoicing in the fact that she is walking in the testimony of the things that for a long time I had to repeatedly sow in, sow in, sow in, and they are real. She's walking in them. She's not ringing me distraught. She's like, oh my goodness, Kylie, God is so faithful. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And that didn't happen over one coffee. Many, many coffees. And you're going to have to get dirty to become clean, in a sense. Let the muck come out. Get real. Like, this is real. You've seen this. From the outside, you've seen what we went through. You might not have known the intimate details of it, but you've seen that we were in strife. Week in, week out. Weeping, crying, screaming. <laughs> Just a few months ago, God, why haven't you helped me? When will you stand up for me? What was me? But, you know, I was kind of at the end of my, my tether again and again. God, you've witnessed this. You can't deny this. This is awesome. And we have been running with one another for a long time. And it's sad to say that I don't know the intimate details of all of your lives. We're such a small crowd. And that's one of the testimonies that I loved when the um, team came back from India was the intimate relationships, this pastor, knowing 2,000 people and their names and their lives. And their lives. <laughs> I don't even know what half of you did this week. That's bad. And that doesn't mean that we go and we write in our diary a program and a, and a structure. But what it means is that we, we become intimate. Iron sharpens iron. Only when it's being rubbed up against each other. Otherwise, they're just two swords on the shelf. That's it. They have to be rubbing up against one another to sharpen one another, right? You guys have a responsibility. Jesus just left the disciples. <laughs> he went on to Galilee. He'd sown the seed. The harvest had come in and he left his disciples. He had other things to, to concern him with, with his father's business. But he left these disciples to disciple and steward the harvest that they didn't even lay before. That is profound. And we have a harvest here that we're not even good at stewarding. We have one another. Encourage one another daily, it says in the word. Exhort one another. When you're going through trials, no one here is going to fix it, but you can pray. <laughs> you can come into agreement, like Cheryl came into agreement with the promise that the Lord had given me. God said it. I believe it with you, sister. And when you doubt, I'm going to remind you. Isn't that awesome? That's brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is, I'm going to end on this scripture. John 12, 24, 26. And if need be in dying, hang on, I've missed some. Let me go back. I've, I've missed it somewhere. John 12. There we go. I tell you the solemn truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains... <laughs> hey, man, he's in the word. <laughs> Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself. It remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. The one who loves his life destroys it, and the one who hates his life in this world guards it for eternal for eternal life. If anyone wants to serve me, he must follow me. And where I am, my servant will be too. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. 
So we are to conform wholly to the example of Christ. And what's that? Journey to the cross, dying to self, being buried in that death with Christ and then coming forth in the resurrection life of who he is. And we, if we are entrusted with one person, that's the whole purpose. You lead them to that cross. They must get on it. They must die. They must be buried. And then they can come into resurrection life. That's our purpose. That's Discipleship 101. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your encouragement. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for those momentary divine encounters with you that teach us, that lead us, that bring us into deeper intimacy with you, Lord. We bless you this morning. We remember your goodness. We remember your faithfulness. We remember that even when we are faithless, you are faithful. And God, we want to increase. Lord Jesus, would you come and increase our capacity to believe, to have faith in the one in whom God sent, to believe for the greater things, to not initiate, to not try, but when given, to be good stewards, to disciple well, to lead people to Jesus and Jesus alone and to trust you in all things, that our lives would be a testimony of I had to and I must follow the Lord. We bless you this morning. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.